the Tika T1X this week on Mail Call Mondays. Mail Call Mondays is brought to you by Modular Driven Technologies. If you need a chassis system for your precision rifle, check out mdttac.com. I'm John McQuay with 8541 Tactical, and this is Mail Call Mondays, the show that answers your questions about precision rifles, optics, and equipment. Welcome to another Mail Call Mondays, and this Monday we are going to talk about our NRL 22 base class build. And Obviously, uh, we have made a determination on what rifle we are going to use for the base class build, and it is the Tika T1X. Uh, I did post a poll up on our Patreon page asking you guys to give us some input on what rifle you wanted to see in the base class build, and the CZ457 actually won out. The CZ457 Pro Varmint, uh, but the problem that we run into is they just really aren't available. They're back ordered everywhere right now. And I didn't want to put this project off for a number of months because uh, we are getting ready to start the next season of National Rifle League 22 competition. Uh, so I went ahead and ran down to Whitaker Guns and picked up the Tika T1X MTR. Uh, this rifle looks like it is going to be a very good option because first of all, the base price on it, or the MSRP on it, is $499. Now, I picked this one up for $419. I did purchase it retail uh, just because I didn't want to take the time to try to work through all this and actually get a sample sent out. Uh, so we went ahead and just picked that up. It comes with a 20-inch barrel. It is already threaded half 28, uh, so my uh, Gemtech Outback 2 suppressor will thread right on here with no problems at all. It comes with a really nice, uh, it's not knurled or anything, just a really plain thread cap. So if you don't want to use the muzzle threads, they're really not obtrusive. It doesn't take away uh, from the aesthetics of the rifle. The barrel is uh, not really a full bull barrel. It's actually thinner uh, than what you see on some of the uh, Savage Mark II rifles. But I don't think that's really going to cause us a problem going forward. We'll see when we do some accuracy testing on it. Uh, the interesting part is back here in the action. Uh, the T1X utilizes the same footprint as the T3. Uh, so what that means is chassis systems for the T3 will fit the T1X. Now, obviously, that's not a, a, a big consideration for base class. Uh, but what that does is that gives us an upgrade path should we start out in base class and decide to go to open class. Uh, so you can start out with the standard injection molded plastic stock that we have here and work your way all the way up to something like a modular driven technologies ACC chassis uh, for the T3 and this will drop into it. Uh, one of the really nifty things about that is the magazine well and magazine release is actually screwed to the bottom of the action. It's not part of the stock. Uh, so when you take this out of this stock and you put it into something else, uh, you just kind of have the magazine well floating in the larger AICS style magazine well like you would uh, with the um, ACC chassis. No um, Voodoo magazines for the V22, the AICS pattern 22 magazines uh, will not work in that situation if you try to drop this into a center fire chassis that is AICS compatible. So uh, don't worry about that. You're probably just going to be stuck with using the Tika magazines. Uh, the magazines, the, the gun does come with one 10 round magazines. Uh, it is a slight drawback with the magazines. They're about $35 a piece. I haven't found them any cheaper anywhere, uh, and they tend to be back ordered in a lot of different places. So I will probably end up shooting my first match with just one magazine until I can get a couple of spares in. Uh, NRL 22 competition, the stages are only 10 round stages. Uh, so having spare magazines is not a big deal, but I don't know how durable these magazines are yet, so I don't want to run into the chance where I bounce one off the pavement or step on one or something of that nature, crack a magazine, and then not able to finish a match because I have to feed out of the magazine. Uh, so I will likely get at least two more of these guys, uh, but they are a really nice setup. You have this really large uh, gripping surface down here on the bottom. Uh, they are very easy to get into the rifle. The only drawback is the mag latch is on the front, 
And if you are doing a magazine change with your support side hand, not a big deal, uh, but you can't just hit the mag release with your strong side hand and dump the mag. Again, we're not doing mag changes in NRL 22, so it's not a consideration there unless you dump a couple of shots uh, for whatever reason, bad ammo, light primer strikes, and then, yeah, you may need to reload. Uh, so we'll see how we handle that going forward. There's a big beefy bolt stop on the left-hand side of the rifle, and the bolt is about a 60 degree, maybe a little bit less bolt lift. So uh, you go from locked down to straight out to the side, almost 90 degrees, which will allow you to clear a lot of scopes out here. Now the handle is kind of short and it is kind of small, but they are replaceable. And I have gone ahead and ordered a larger bolt knob just to try it out. Although I don't believe changing the bolt knob will be legal for base class. Uh, it's just something I want to see as far as, again, that upgrade path for later on. Another drawback that we ran into with this, though, is it is a dovetail uh, scope mounting system up here. Uh, so you will notice that I have a Tasco 6-24 varmint scope on here. Um, it was the only scope that I had uh, handy that is the magnification range that I want to test ammo for this thing that had a one inch tube that will work with the dovetail rings that I have. And again, these are just some cheap Tasco dovetail rings. Um, that is the only setup I had that would allow me to mount a scope on it immediately because I picked up this rifle Saturday. So we have only had it a couple of days. It is drilled and tapped on the top and Several manufacturers now do make a Picatinny scope base uh, that will screw in here. Uh, we went ahead and ordered a uh, DIP scope base as well as the DIP bolt knob. Uh, but Area 419 also makes one, and I will more than likely get a hold of one of the Area 419 bases as well to compare the quality. The Area 419 is about twice as expensive as the DIP, uh, but there's no question that Area 419 products are absolutely top-notch. So I really want to check that scope base out. And again, for a base class NRL competition, uh, the scope base, rings, etc., those are not factored into the price. So that $1,050 price limit is just the rifle itself and the optic itself. Uh, rings, bases, bipods, cheek risers, all that stuff is outside of that. So the bolt manipulation is fairly smooth to begin with. Again, this is brand new. I haven't even lubricated the bolt yet. It is just the way it comes out of the package. Uh, the trigger pull, I haven't thrown a gauge on it yet, uh, but it feels like it's in that uh, three to four pound range. Uh, the quote in the manual says it will go down to two and a half pounds. I wanna shoot some accuracy testing with it before I break it out of the stock and dial the trigger pull down on it. But we will uh, go ahead and check and see what the minimum trigger pull is without actually uh, monkeying with anything. And then what the trigger pull is without replacing any components in it. Uh, the trigger pull is very crisp. It has a very nice feel to it. Uh, it's just a little bit heavy right now for as light a weight rifle as this is. Uh, what I have found is that when you're shooting barricades, you're shooting competition, um, if the lighter the rifle is, the lighter the trigger pull needs to be so that you don't disrupt the rifle uh, during the pull of the trigger. Uh, it's easier when you're uh, bipod and you're bagged in. You can drive that rifle pretty hard, get it settled in nice and steady, and then a heavier trigger pull should not make a big difference, like when we go test ammo for this. Uh, but if you're shooting it off of, um, say, a tank trap, and you only have one point of contact of the rifle, uh, then a lighter weight trigger pull is really going to help in that situation. Now, the one of the few drawbacks of this rifle is we do have a pretty low comb here. Uh, now, I can get an okay uh, cheek weld to be able to see through the scope with the low mounting system that I have here. Obviously, when we put the Picatinny rail on here, it's going to raise things up a little bit. And uh, depending upon what scope we get, uh, we may need to bump up to medium rings to be able to clear the bell against the barrel up here. And so that means I'm going to have to raise up the comb just a little bit. Uh, that is perfectly allowable in NRL base class. And what we will probably do is throw some uh, Victor Company Titan Universal cheek spacers on here. Uh, they will fit on and then just screw down into the top uh, with two screws. Really easy, really simple mounting system. Uh, hopefully they will fit with the contour of the 
the comb just fine. I have a feeling they will. They've worked well on other uh, situations that we've run into like that. And that will give us a no-nonsense, non-flexing, uh, non-moving place to put our cheek. Uh, we could, if you're really on a tight budget, just build it up uh, with isomat, just with foam and rigorous tape. Uh, that is the old school way to do it, and that is perfectly acceptable. Uh, but the Titan Universal Cheek Rest is a relatively reasonably priced option, and it just gives you a much, much cleaner look and a much finer overall finished product. The bipod that we have on here right now is a Harris bipod with a pod lock on it that I just pulled off of another rifle. We have a single sling stud up front, single sling stud out back, and that is it uh, for the sling mounting points. Uh, now, I regret that I'm rolling this without having checked the rules before we started. I believe I can add sling mounting points on the stock without bumping out of base class. And should that be the case, I will probably go ahead and put flush cups in this stock so I can run one of the uh, precision rifle uh, long range oriented slings like the uh, Tab Gear PRS sling. Uh, that way I can run that sling on here and be good to go. Now, if I go check and that is not the case, uh, then what I will probably do is just go to uh, Walmart and pick up one of the slings that they have there, just a regular web sling uh, that has a normal sling stud mounting point um, and run that. And that will kind of be a little bit more into the budget oriented um, idea here. Uh, but those slings are absolutely serviceable. As long as it doesn't really stretch, as long as it's a fairly rigid sling, uh, then you can make it work. Uh, the sling mounting points where they are located at on here. If you were shooting offhand, you would want to take the bipod off and use the farther forward, uh, can't speak today, farther forward sling mounting point rather than trying to go off the back of the bipod like some guys do. Back of the bipod is fine if you are carrying the rifle. Uh, it's not the best if you're going to get a tight, hasty sling to shoot from. Now the bipod, I haven't decided yet if we are gonna go ahead and just run this with the Harris bipod. Obviously that doesn't cost us anything because we already have the Harris bipod. I've got a couple of them running around here and this one is still set up to go on old school sling studs. Uh, but I almost wanna go grab another Caldwell bipod and throw a Caldwell on here because it is just a much lower price point. Uh, and they do work somewhat. Uh, they're not ideal, they are not as robust as the um, Harris bipods, but we're talking about a um, 22 here, not a ton of recoil. We don't have to worry about the strongest springs keeping the bipod legs deployed. Uh, and if you guys check out our review video over the Caldwell bipod, the XLA adjustable bipod, um, it worked fairly well even on a center fire rifle. So we'll leave the link to that video uh, down below. Make sure you check that guy out if you're wondering how well that bipod will work. And I think it'll work fine on this setup. Now, a couple of other things that, again, I have to really read the rules critically before we go ahead and do. Um, one advantage with the Tika is this uh, grip here is modular. It doesn't really look like it, but there is a line here and there's one screw back here holding it in. You remove that screw and this grip will come off. And uh, Tika does make a vertical grip that goes in here. I went ahead and ordered it uh, from Beretta and uh, I don't know how quickly they are gonna ship it. Obviously this is a holiday weekend, so I would assume I'm probably not gonna have it for another uh, week and a half to two weeks. And I also ordered the beaver tail forend. So there is a slide on beaver tail forend for this guy uh, that is then uh, secured by a screw back here. So I really wanna see how that feels overall shooting supported because uh, my hand is large enough that I really have trouble finding places to put my fingers when I'm shooting this um, slung up. And a beaver tail forearm will help me uh, get a little bit flatter uh, area and stop my fingers from wrapping over and touching the barrel, just touching the stock. And also I think that wider forearm will work better riding a bag like a game changer uh, when we're shooting off a barricade and I have the bipod removed. So I have to look at the rules specifically and find out if um, factory uh, supported additions to the stock are acceptable or not. I don't know if that is really spelled out in the rules. Again, I apologize for not looking at that point specifically before we rolled today. 
The overall idea of the Tika T1X I think is really great. I am really, really looking forward to getting this to the range and seeing how well it shoots uh, with a variety of different 22 ammunition that we have in here and uh, see what we can do to make this the best base class rifle that we possibly can. I'm going to try to not go overboard on any of the accessories on here. Obviously, we could do stuff like put a spur mount on here and um, we could replace the trigger. Trigger replacement is acceptable. I do have a uh, Yodave replacement trigger spring on the way in. Uh, apparently with this spring, we can get under one pound trigger pull weight. At least that's what's advertised. And the spring is $10. Uh, so I figured that really stayed with the uh, base price budget idea of this stock. Because if for 10 bucks, uh, we can get a crisp, clean 12 ounce trigger pull, um, that is a huge win in my book. And I think that will be good to go. Um, Overall, I'm really happy with the fit and finish of the rifle. We have not had it to the range yet, so I can't give you a thorough review on it. Um, but for this uh, $419 that we paid for it, I'm, I'm fairly happy with it. Uh, it is a fairly lightweight rifle, and this is a double-edged sword. Um, I don't like too light a weight uh, for my purposes for me shooting the rifle. I much prefer a rifle even a 22 caliber that weighs closer to what centerfire competition rifles weigh. But uh, this will be a great option for young shooters because uh, one of my alternative motives for this, or ulterior motive, uh, is to get this in the hands of my 11-year-old. I took the 17-year-old out to shoot NRL 22 this weekend, and he seemed to have a good time with it. Uh, he shot the Voodoo with me, and he is fine moving that rifle around. Uh, but it would be a little bit too much weight for my 11-year-old to throw around. Uh, so this, I think, will allow him to concentrate more on getting the gun into position than just concentrate on muscling the gun around and still uh, obeying uh, muscle, muzzle discipline with it. So that is the rifle overall, the way it sits right now. We'll put the cheek piece on it, put the grip on it, and then... Uh, adjust the trigger and that really runs into about it on what you can do uh, for base class. Now, I do need to talk about the scope. As I mentioned, this is just an old Tasco varmint scope that I had laying around. This is actually one of the, the first scopes I got when I was getting back into uh, precision rifle shooting because it's not a horrible scope. Uh, it's just uh, nowhere even close to the equipment that I use now. Uh, hopefully it will uh, be accurate enough and consistent enough that we can do some 50-yard ammunition testing with it. Uh, but if it works for that, that's really all I care about. It is not a scope that I want to shoot in NRL competition with uh, for a couple of reasons. One is it has an adjustable objective up here, which is not uh, allow me to see the parallax markings from the back of the rifle. So while I'm in position, I can't see what my parallax setting is. I'd have to come up here and roll it and hope I get close. Um, the turrets are also capped, and it has a standard mill dot reticle, which a regular mill dot reticle is not the best, again, for shooting NRL 22. Uh, the targets tend to be a little bit smaller, close in. Uh, the targets tend to be a little bit finer, and once they get beat up and the paint knocked off of them, you really want to be able to see clearly. So I want smaller, finer markings on the reticle than the standard mill dots. So what we come to now is what I want to hear from you guys is what your recommendations are, what scope you want to see for NRL 22. And we posted a new poll up on our Patreon page, and I will leave a link to it down below. So I'd really love you guys to head over there and to click what scope you want to see. Now, I've got a couple of scopes laid out here. Some of them are represented in that poll. Uh, some are not. Uh, so they will be extra purchases for us. So it's, uh, it's kind of beneficial for us to include these in the poll. Now, the uh, first scope that I have sitting here uh, is the Athlon. I believe this is the uh, Argos 8 to 34 by 56. This is their uh, BTR. It is a relatively high magnification for NRL 22, but it does adjust down to 15 yards on the parallax. It has a mil radian reticle in it, mil turrets, uh, one tenth mil clicks, five mil per rev. 
Um, I've already got a cattail on this. I have shot this in NRL 22 competition on the 1022, uh, so I know it works. It would be just fine for competition, and it comes in at a fairly low price point, so we are still uh, well within our base class budget. Um, obviously already have it. Uh, it's already got rings on it, so it's easy once the DIP mount comes in uh, to be able to just throw it on here, get to the range, and start work with it. Uh, but it is a big scope. It is a bulky scope. Um, 32 or 34 power is not really usable in this scope. You really want to stay around that 20 to 25 power. Uh, you go up much higher than that and the glass gets really milky. It's not clear. Uh, so definitely drawbacks uh, with this scope, uh, but one of our amazing viewers sent this in a while back, and so um, it's uh, really value added for us. Um, over here to the right, we have a primary arms 4-14 uh, FFP R-Grid scope. Uh, so this is the right power range. It's about a $250 scope, so well within the budget. Um, it's uh, smaller, a little, much smaller than the uh, Athlon here, a little bit lighter weight, but our maximum magnification is only 14 power. Uh, 14 power may hurt a little bit for 100 yard paper stages. Uh, for the rest of it, not so much. Uh, the R-Grid reticle, I'm not sure how well that is going to work for um, precision with the 22. Uh, the center uh, chevron on it tends to be a little bit heavier than I'd like, uh, but starting at the one mil mark and going down, uh, the mill holds and the hash marks are fine enough that it will be just fine. Uh, so I'm kind of interested to see how this works. Uh, regardless of which direction we go, we may go ahead and mount this up and uh, run a NRL 22 style stage just to see uh, how well this works at that. Um, Scopes that I do not have here that are on that pole. Uh, the top runner is the easy one to mention, and that is the Vortex Diamondback Tactical First Focal Plane. Uh, now that is probably the most expensive scope. Uh, it's about $500. It maxes out uh, the top bar budget almost. Um, so it is really one of the most expensive scopes that would still be legal for us to shoot on a $500 uh, MSRP rifle. Um, it has fairly clean, distinct turrets for that price point. Uh, you have the EBR reticle. You can get it in mil mil or MOA and MOA. Uh, so it has a ton of options. The scope glass is fairly clear. I got a chance to look at one on another rifle uh, this weekend at the NRL 22 match. And I think that may be the best option for maxing this setup out. So if you're trying to max the budget out on this rifle, I think that may be the best option. Uh, but again, that is maxing out the budget. Uh, so I'm not sure how you guys feel about it, but I really, really want to know, especially down in the comments below and on that poll. And then uh, the next scope uh, down from that uh, is the Cabela's Covenant. And we actually put two different of the Covenant scopes on the list. Uh, the Covenant 5 uh, comes in at a little cheaper price point. It has a 30 millimeter main tube. Um, and I believe that one was the 5 to 25 power. Uh, then we flip over to the other side and we have the Covenant 7. Uh, the Covenant 7 comes in at a higher price point. I believe that was a $400 price point overall. Uh, you get a 34 millimeter tube with that. Uh, so we should get a little bit more elevation adjustment, which if we take this out and do a long range 22 match, uh, that will definitely be beneficial. Um, Again, we're still well under what that Diamondback Tactical is, and you get some really nice features with the Covenant 5 and Covenant 7 scopes. Uh, the drawback for us is that uh, this is a scope that really is only retailed in the U.S. It's only available through Cabela's, uh, so I don't know how accessible it is to our uh, European our German and our Australian viewers. Uh, so it may be something you guys are interested in, it may be not. We have quite a few of uh, viewers in that country or those countries that want to check that out. So 
If you guys do want to see the Cabela's, uh, they are definitely the rear running scopes right now on our poll, but please go over and tell me what kind of interest you have in them. They look like really solid scopes, and even if we don't use it for this setup, I may go ahead and get one of those in uh, just to check them out for uh, precision rifle use in general. Uh, then finally, uh, we have the Bushnell Engage. And the Bushnell Engage is the only scope that's in the lineup that is a second focal plane scope. And I really want to throw that in because it is a second focal plane scope. Uh, it is a 4216 power scope, so 16 power on the top end is less than I normally run, but it is still more than usable. Uh, we do have parallax adjustment down to 20 yards, uh, so it does focus close enough. Uh, we do have uh, quarter MOA turrets, and this does have uh, their MOA graduated reticle in it. Uh, so it is an MOA, MOA scope. Uh, again, perfectly fine, uh, but you know we'll, we'll see how that uh, works out overall. Uh, it does have locking turrets, uh, which is a nice feature, and it does have toolless adjustments on the turrets. We haven't done a lot uh, with this scope, mainly because it is a second focal plane scope, and my preference is for first focal plane. Uh, the ramifications of that for NRL 22, though, is it means those stages where you are going to be bouncing back and forth between a 100-yard target and a 25-yard target, which there are quite a few, um, it means you're going to be stuck on 16 power. You're not going to be able to dial that guy back and forth and use your holdovers because the holdovers are only going to be accurate at 16. Now, I could apply a correction factor, so I could uh, say, okay, at 16, I'm going to hold um, whatever my stated value is, and then at 8 power, I'm going to double it. Um, you can do that. Um, you just have to remember, and that becomes a problem when you're trying to dial your parallax, you're trying to locate your targets in the grass, you're trying to go back and forth. Uh, so, not really my preference, uh, but if you guys want to see it because the price point is right, uh, we may go ahead and do that. Uh, but it's going to take a pretty resounding uh, vote for me to want to go with a second focal plane scope. Uh, price is right, just the second focal plane is a ding against them, and Bushnell doesn't have a lot uh, in that $500 range that will work well for NRL 22. So that about ramps it up for the scopes that we lined up for the poll, but I'm sure there are scopes that I'm missing out there. If there is something that you would want to see on this rifle that is in the $551 or below price point, please leave it in the comment section below or go comment on our poll on Patreon. I really want to hear what you guys have to say. I really want to set this guy up uh, to be something that would be a pattern for those of you out there that are not sure if you want to break into NRL 22 competition or not. I want you to be able to go out, set up a rig that will be competitive in base class and have the ability to expand into open class later on. Um, I am really eyeballing that Diamondback Tactical and then the Covenant 7 scopes because uh, those appear to me to be good options uh, to be able to start on a base class rifle but still be able to retain that scope going forward into open class. I don't really think the Diamondback Tactical FFP is going to hurt you uh, going into open class. Uh, as long as it retains zero, as long as we can dial uh, forward and back, get through the range that we need to, and perfectly return to zero on it, uh, that scope is not going to cost you any points. So that's kind of where I'm leaning right now. But again, the Athlon is already here and the Covenant scopes are really interesting for me. So drop your comments in the comments section down below. And that's it for this Mail Call Mondays. I hope you guys are having a great Memorial Day. Please make sure, have fun, have your barbecues, have whatever you have going on with your families, but remember to honor the sacrifices of our veterans. That really is what Memorial Day is for. Uh, so keep them in mind as you go about your day. If you guys have liked this video, please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Click that little bell icon down there to be notified when we release new videos. We release new content every week, uh, so make sure you click the bell icon so we can let you know. If you guys have any questions or comments for Mail Call Mondays or questions over anything we've covered, leave them in the comment section below or send it to us on Facebook or Twitter. If you guys are listening to us on your favorite podcast app, please send questions to us at 8541tactical at gmail.com. And until next time, get out and shoot.